Howdy, this is Jim Rutt, and this is The Jim Rutt Show. Today's guest is John Robb, thinker and writer about global-level systems and conflicts. His main platform is Global Gorillas. You can Google it. Hi, Jim. Thanks for having me on. John has a most interesting background. Uh, He was a graduate of the U.S. Air Force Academy. He then served something like seven years in the Air Force before resigning to return to the private sector. After getting a master's from Yale, he went to work for Forrester Research back in the 90s. It was the leading big picture and strategic technology research house. In fact, I uh, knew George Colony there reasonably well. Very interesting guy. In fact, that Forrester, John's the guy who initiated a dedicated service for some newfangled thing called the Internet. And I guess that kind of worked out, huh? Yeah, it did. It did. (laughs) Yeah, George Colony was the editor on my first report, which was kind of cool. Very interesting guy. In fact, when I was at Thompson, we thought about buying our way into that industry, you know, buying Forrester and then another smaller one. And I uh, you know, went up and met with George, chatted with him about it. It was clear he was not interested in selling, but uh, he and I hit it off so well. We basically stayed for quite a while, correspondence and friends and sent each other books and what have you. Uh, really enjoyed him. He was a good guy. After being at Forrester, he decided, hey, look, I can do this shit. These other clowns are starting companies. So he went out and became a tech entrepreneur. Co-founded a company called Gomez, a uh, performance measurement company, which was acquired in 2009 by CompuWare. He was also president of Userland, a company that's not that well remembered today, but was extraordinarily inf- influential in its day. Uh, it's fair to say that no company has that was more influential in developing what came to be known as blogging. While they didn't quite invent it, uh, they were, as far as I recall, the first real popularizer of the RSS format for distributing and aggregating blogs. Wasn't that right, John? Uh, yeah, Dave Weiner actually was an, a co-author of it. Yeah. Um, and and uh, we, we did RSS and then we combined it with blogging and uh, the output became a, a network blogging system, which is exactly what you see with Facebook and Twitter and, and the like. Or Medium, you know, it's, you know yeah. sort of a classic uh, network blogging system. Uh, in 2004, John started his blog, Global Gorillas, where he's posted a long series of deep and thoughtful analysis of current events, the world situation, tactics and strategy, and perspectives about the future. Uh, we'll work our way up to deep things, but let's start with your take on the recent attack on the Saudi Arabian Fuel Processing Center. What do we know? What's going on? Well, um... We were completely surprised across the board. We didn't have any human or SIGINT indication that the attack was coming. Um, so it was a failure of intelligence. And then there was a failure of, of battlefield intelligence, battlefield awareness. Um, we weren't able to detect the attack until it was actually commencing in, in process. It went by the Aegis destroyers in the Gulf, you know, with their air defense systems, state of the art on a, you know, flat, you know, pancake flat terrain, which is like, you know, perfect environment to detect um, missiles and, and drones. And then, um, you know, all the Patriot missile batteries. I think uh, the Saudis had 88. This attack blew right past them too. They didn't detect it at all, essentially? Nope. And uh, the only thing that actually uh, triggered was the uh, the guns uh, attached to the uh, point defense system set up at the, uh, at the processing facility. So uh, essentially what we had is a, you know, a completely surprising attack on probably the most well-defended, most uh, important oil or energy hub in the world. It's, it's a, you know, for years, I mean, for decades, everyone's been speculating on you know, how this facility would be attacked. It's, you know, Abcake is attached to Gawar, and Gawar is the, the massive oil field that's produced, I think, a 60 to 70% of all of Saudi Arabia's oil. Produces 5 million barrels a day, a little over. Um, and it's been doing that 40, 50 years. And Abcake processes it, it takes out the sulfur. It does, it's a, you know, a monstrous facility, um, has, you know, very expensive equipment. Yet, you know, uh, it's obviously very vulnerable to this new type of attack. Uh, drones relatively slowly being able to maneuver to come in from directions that, that aren't anticipated, uh, flying very low using relatively inexpensive equipment to do it. You can do it with GPS. You can do it with, you know, staggering the launch. Uh, so the, uh, the drones come in, you know, every minute or simultaneously from different directions. So um, that's what we know. <laughs> 
it was a classic asymmetric warfare. As I understood it, these drones were maybe ten or twenty thousand dollars each, something like that. And where they shoot, bring in twenty eight of them, something like that. So you're talking, you know, less than a million dollars. And uh, you know, if they'd followed it up with a couple of more, they could have completely disrupted the oil economy, right? Oh yeah, exactly. Uh, you know, the oil the oil market obviously is is a very inelastic market, and it, you know. Market inelasticity means that you know once you get into a little bit of shortage, uh, the prices can go way up um, because people continue to buy. They, they don't have the ability to just switch it out. And uh, we've been in a surplus for quite a while, and, and to have this kind of taken off, you know, five and a half million barrels a day of production taken off the table uh, instantaneously put us right into that you know edge of shortage condition. So any more loss would have shot the price up well over a hundred bucks. Then the last time that happened, you know, we had the global recession that kicked off the financial collapse. Yeah. And if you remember the other thing about the commodities explosion in 2007, it led to revolutions all across the Middle East. Right. Right. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, got all kinds of second order effects. So what was the failure mode? I mean, not only did, were there U.S. assets in the area, but the Saudis uh, spend vastly more than, let's say, the Iranians do on defense. How could this happen? Well, I mean, they don't have any drone defense, but it's, you know, it's just the asymmetry, you know, you you can have drones coming in from Iraq and, and from Yemen and from uh, opponents that you don't anticipate having to fight, or at least at that distance. I mean, we had some warning. I mean, Yemenis had attacked other facilities. They attacked the uh, East-West Pipeline just a couple months prior, you know, a, a pumping facility, successfully using drones. So um, there was a warning that this would occur, but, um, you know, this is, this is a classic systems disruption. It's, it's hitting critical nodes in these big networks that we depend on and causing all sorts of cascades of failure. And, and there's really not an easy way to fix that. In fact, I don't think there's a, a good way to fix it at all. You just have to reduce your dependency on those networks. And the other thing, of course, you know, a truism in uh, military history is militaries tend to fight the last war, right? So they have the Aegis ships out there in the Gulf looking to shoot down F-14s or something, but instead come tiny little drones flying low and slow. Oops, our uh, you know billion-dollar Aegis ships can't even deal with those, right? Right. On the other hand, if someone had actually been forwardly thinking and said, well, wait a minute, uh, let's war game this out, asymmetric drone warfare is going to be an obvious thing. You know, we could have spent vastly smaller sums and built counter drone systems, you know, more point defense, because fortunately drones are slow and they're not stealthy, at least the ones that were used here. So if you would rang the facility with point defense weapons with high granular radar, probably could have shot them all down for not a whole lot of money. Well, I, it actually may end up being more expensive to do the, all the, you know, the point defense effort because you have to defend a lot of different points. <laughs> and there's a, you can't get the economies of scale you get on these systems with you know, hundreds of miles of range. Yeah, that's the truth of that. On the other hand, for a small number of very vulnerable and ultra high value ones like the oil facility, it makes a lot of sense. Pro probably not going to defend every government office building. Interesting. Where do you think the attack came from? Did it come from Yemen? Did it come from Iran? Or do we know yet? Um, combination, I think, of an attack from Yemen and from Iraq. From Iraq? Yeah, they, the Iranians staged an attack from Iraq. Ah, okay, okay. So, uh, yeah, there wasn't any real easy way to detect it unless you were looking in those directions. Of course, they should have been, <laughs> but they weren't. Pearl Harbor all over again, right? Should have, but they didn't. For the Saudis, it definitely was Pearl Harbor. I mean, it really, the big impact on them is that it really screwed with their IPO. Yep. Uh, they're taking Aramco public and, you know, at a potential $2 trillion offering, and this easily slammed a half a trillion off of that <laughs> or more because now the system is actually shown to be vulnerable and that they're incapable of defending it. And, you know, again, from a bigger perspective, it, it ought to substantially undercut you know, the, the whole position of the Saudi regime, you know, the world's last uh, absolute monarchy, right? Right. And feudal empire, right? Get rid of them sons of bitches, right? <laughs> but, uh, and this, you know, shows the world that they can be taken down easily, right? So probably the Iranians uh, and other folks have said, all right, when the day comes and we decide we really want to take the Saudis out, we'll just knock all their oil out and leave it out for a year or two. Just constant rain of these damn things, right? Yep. And there's nothing they can do about it. You know, that's going to, as you say, going to very much reduce the interests of other people in investing large sums of money into that area, at least so long as the Saudi regime remains in power. Yeah, but it also kind of exposed that the fact that the, the U.S. really isn't as interested in the Middle East as they used to be. 
because we produce so much oil. Absolutely. And uh, it's changed our perspective. I mean, we made the strategic error, the grand strategic error of focusing on the Middle East as a, as a primary hotspot, as, as something that we should and needed to actively engage with back in uh, at the end of the Cold War, you know, largely based on projections that we weren't going to be able to produce oil um, and that the oil market would continue to contract due to Chinese uh, demand ramping up and that uh, U.S. production was over. And that was completely reversed about halfway through the uh, Iraq war, proven to be false. Um, and that you know, initial strategic decision um, has been yielding nothing but uh, damage to the U.S. since then. Yeah, the forever wars, right? What a bunch of stupid ideas. Correct. Though, you know, one question about that. Why has there been no response to the uh, Iranian attack? Uh, you know, Trump was all huffing and puffing and then didn't do anything. Um, I think uh, Trump is, he's, he's very uh, big on rhetoric, particularly when it comes to international engagements, but he's very uh, negative on getting engaged in a, in a foreign conflict. He just shies away from it. But I also think that the Saudis uh, didn't want to uh, increase the tensions. They didn't want to you know, you know, engage in a full scale uh, war with Iran while fighting in, in Yemen, while trying to, you know, refinance basically the kingdom uh, by going, you know, going to the public markets. They would have totally tanked that for as long as, the, <laughs> as long as we could project. So, you know, the Saudis saying no, and then, and then Trump's natural inclination, he's, he's placed trade strategy ahead of um, national security strategy. Uh, used to, trade used to be just a, uh, you know, slave to the national security, you know, whatever was best in terms of, you know, the security of the global system. We, we let the, the trade strategy uh, accommodate that. And then he's reversed that relationship. National security is now in um, enthralled to the, uh, the trade strategy, whatever improves our trade status. Yeah, the, the current example, I, if it's true, I think it probably is, is that Trump gave assurances to the Chinese that we would not meddle in Hong Kong if they would provide some concessions on trade. Correct. And that was all leaked. All, I mean, all that recent China stuff was all leaked from China to the U.S. paper. So they basically did the, yeah, did exactly the same thing that you know Russia has been doing, you know, interfered in our national politics. But no one really uh, paid attention to that because it's anti-Trump. Yeah. Well, the other thing is, it, and this is the thing that's a little bit disingenuous about this Russia stuff. Every country has been messing in every other country's elections, right? People forget Obama med meddled in both the Brexit vote and the previous Israeli elections, right? He, he came out and said who he wanted. I mean, that's definitely meddling. People don't mention that. So, uh, and you know, it's as if the U.S. hasn't meddled in elections all over the world all the time. I am a little surprised by the disingenuousness of the focus on, oh, these bad Russians. Yes, uh, we should be uh, making sure we uh, harden ourselves against those things. But to think that they're the first people to ever do this is, is very silly. Uh, let's uh, change directions here a little bit, move up the stack in terms of uh, conceptual stuff. You've popularized the terms the resistance and the insurgency. Uh, often compare and contrast the two and compare the two as kind of interacting systems. Could you briefly describe them and tell us how those movements are impacting our political situation today? Okay. Well, um, the concept is, is that the American political scene is now the battleground between two social networks, you know, weaponized social networks that have uh, taken over the political process. It started with the insurgency, which is the uh, rejection of the establishment that vaulted and put Trump into office. The insurgency uh, is a maneuver-based insurgency. It, it disrupts systems. Uh, it causes chaos and because of that chaos, it's, it disrupts the decision-making process of, of the opposition, um, the established opposition, as well as uh, any network opposition. Um, and it's been fairly effective. I mean, it put Trump in office. It's maintaining his popularity. Uh, Trump is a, a natural uh, in terms of, uh, of that kind of maneuver-based disruptive strategy. He's, he has lots of what, what's called a fast transience. He moves from one topic to the next, one disruption to the next. There's never really any time for the uh, the opposition to get uh, build up momentum in terms of opposition on any specific point. Um, the resistance is the uh, network that's been most effective at combating the insurgency, and uh, it found its its purchase in in the uh, identity side. Uh, very values focused. It's puritanical in in many respects. Doesn't 
put up with violations of, of values. And um, it's in the process of taking over the Democratic Party. And, you know, we're seeing the kind of compromised mainstream candidates being, uh, you know, thrown to the side like Biden and anyone who's like, who would try to straddle the middle ground. AOC, for instance, is, you know, the perfect example of, of the uh, resistance fighter, uh, the resistance uh, uh, participant. And both of these networks are, are open source, meaning there's not any one specific person that that's leader. Those, those people that you see at the front uh, tend to be more like a weaponized version of the network. Um, there's lots of, you know, conflicting ideas within these open source networks, um, but they're, you know, all agreed on, on, a, on a single, you know, animating purpose. So, uh, you know, that's just the, the core of the idea. Yep. Let's talk a little bit about these networks, right? We, you know, over on, on Facebook, we have a group called Rally Point Alpha. I think you're a member of that, aren't you, John? Mm -hmm. I'm a manager of it, I guess. Ah, okay. Uh, the, uh, that's right. Uh, that's a group where we, based on an essay by Jordan Hall, a group of us have gotten together and talked about how collective intelligence uh, networks, decentralized networks, uh, have really completely changed the game, or at least I don't know if they've changed it yet, but they're in the process of changing the game. Right. Could you talk a little bit about the nature of these networks? You know, I started looking at networks as a, um, a new kind of organizational uh, framework after the Iraq invasion. Um, you know, I was seeing results coming from, from that engagement that weren't fitting, you know, the, the media narratives or the analytical narratives coming out of the establishment. So, um, what I saw was something similar to what I was seeing on the internet. It was an open source framework where, um, lots of disparate groups come together to, um, operate as a, as a single unit. Um, but they're only tied together through what's called the plausible promise or, or, the idea of what one single simple goal that everyone can agree on. Often it's like no more corruption or remove this specific leader. Um, in Iraq, there were, you know, 70 different groups and lots of very, very small groups. There were, you know, lots of different flavors of jihadi, uh, lots of different types of nationalists and um, Ba'athists with or without Saddam and criminal groups. And these groups all seem to be able to work together effectively. Um, by focusing on ejecting the United States as the, you know, single goal that united them. If left alone in the room, they would kill each other immediately. <laughs> uh, but they were able to put that to the side. One, one thing we saw with open source networks like this is that they're extremely innovative. At least in the, in the Iraq war, they did more in six months than the uh, Irish Republican Army did in 20 years in terms of innovation. It was very, very quick. We had a $3 billion program for counter IEDs. Uh, whenever we put out a counter, uh, they countered our counter within two weeks. And our release schedule was every three months to six months. So they were beating us very quickly. And um, they shared those innovations. There wasn't really any you know, lockdown. I'm going to keep this for my, my own group. Um, they shared it freely among each other. E each group was able to copy what the other group did and apply it very, very quickly. And there was a, also a sharing through the through the media, kind of a, what I call stigmergy. It's a this idea that um, it comes from insects. Uh, you know, when an ant, you know, finds a, a little food, what they do is they uh, leave a chemical trail. You know, as they carry the food back, uh, that chemical trail acts as a signal for other ants to follow and and find the food. And each ant that does that adds more chemicals to that trail until the food is exhausted. And then. The case of uh, an open source insurgency, you know, every group that made a successful attack, either by innovating on the target selection or innovating on the on the, the method of attack, uh, had it covered in the press, and uh, had it covered, you know, through online coverage, you know, self posting often through their own videos, and that served as kind of a chemical trail that this target was now available for attack, this method works, uh, and then everyone else can copy it. And they copied it until it didn't work and they moved on to the next innovation. So uh, that's some of the attributes of, of open source groups and how they innovate and how they organize. It's, if you can get your head around that kind of core structure, it makes uh, understanding what the resistance and the, and the you know, present day insurgency looks like and how they operate. How did you, because you couldn't take that model and then now remap it to say the emergence of the insurgency in the US in 2016. 
Yeah. So, uh, you know, what we saw in the, kind of the Trump insurgency was that, um, you know, Trump was put up forward as a weapon. He was really good at, you know, disrupting things. But there were hundreds of different subgroups supporting that campaign. And uh, they were constantly innovating. I mean, you had like even the that uh, Reddit group, you know, that, that pro-Trump Reddit group, and they had 300,000 members. I was interviewed on that just a week after Trump was. It was kind of interesting. Um, all of these uh, groups were all coming up with different types of memes, different types of angles of attack on different aspects of the democratic strategy, constantly coming up with, you know, ways of, of countering what was going on at the, uh, on the uh, democratic side. And the Democrats were the classic bureaucracy. They, you know, they were spending uh, gobs of money on, on media and, and professional help. People, consultants said, you know, new elections better than anyone else. They uh, had a you know big ground game, lots of people on the ground. Uh, they had huge databases, but they were all tightly bound up and centrally controlled. And even with all the media on their on their side, you know, supporting their messaging, the insurgency was still able to route around it. That's why I mean it, it's, it's the reason why that the the Russian effort, as ham handed as it was and and kind of diffuse as it was, was you know uh, able to slot right in. You know, it was just one member out of the hundreds that were participating in 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 the insurgency, um, and that if something was successful, if something had you know, some legs in terms of a, a new idea, a new angle of attack, a new disruption, uh, Trump was really good at picking it out and then elevating it and using it in his tweet stream. Then it would echo back to these uh, things and be upregulated. Uh, the group you were talking about on Reddit is called the Donald, I believe. Right? Yeah, the Donald. Yeah. I built a system a couple years back that parsed the Donald in real time. I ran it through a bunch of analytical software and sorted memes and showed trend lines and all that because I had determined that the Donald was the convergence point for the what you would call the insurgency network. Yep. Relatively few memes were actually invented on the Donald, but it's where they were propagated and where they got validity. So things would be cooked up in 4chan or 8chan or in wackier places than that. People would post them to uh, the Donald, and if they got upvoted there, then they might get picked up by Infowars or uh, uh, Breitbart, or even, and then uh, from there they go to Fox News, then Trump yep. picks them up, and then he broadcasts them, and then it upregulates that whole message, and then there's themes and variations on every new invention. So it's very much an evolutionary, fast-tracking kind of system, as you were describing. Exactly. Exactly. You know, you throw it against the wall and see what sticks. Yeah. But but there is a uh, but there is a network structure. It's not just completely chaotic. You know, there are convergent zones. There are amplifiers. There's the maximum amplifier, which was Trump's tweet stream, and it somehow you know came together and worked good enough. Is the, is the insurgency still existing? Does it is it still improving, or is it kind of uh, done its thing in in a senile state these days? Well, I mean, a disruptive insurgency typically has to have an enemy to focus on, right? And um, you know what we saw in at least in regular warfare, we also saw it in the big you know open source protests um, that you know swept the Islamic world. Uh, we saw it just recently with the, the in Puerto Rico and other open source protests that was successful. Is that it has to have an opposition. A single point of opposition uh, to, to focus all their efforts on. Um, so it's been in largely dormant, you know, since the election, and it'll start ramping up again when when the uh, the election starts. Regardless, it's still been um, successful enough to, to allow Trump to still have a forty four percent approval rating. Yeah. Now the resistance. Yeah, the resistance okay. is different. It you know it fights on the moral realm. You know, whereas the maneuver is is all about uh, disrupting uh, your ability to think rationally and cogently. The moral realm, you know, uh, is about attacking your your cohesion, and the resistance is was formed largely online just to you know fight the unstoppable, you know, Trump insurgency, you know, where the traditional Democratic Party has been largely ineffective, uh, where the uh, you know all the you know established players have been you know ineffective. The media has been extraordinarily ineffective at, at stopping Trump. You know, here comes the resistance, and the resistance is now feeding, you know, moral arguments and and, and trying to shape the media, shape the Democratic Party, shape all of the institutions, even corporate space, um, and and try to force it into a mode that will allow it to confront Trump. I mean, 
think of uh, all the moral arguments being put on the big tech companies to start to censor Trump, to center the insurgency, to knock media player media uh, personalities off of YouTube, to delete Trump's Twitter account, to put in place you know automated versions of censorship that would allow this to never occur again. These uh, you know moral warfare is. Um, very similar to what we're also seeing in China and, and its social credit system. And it's a you know, war on anyone who you know, says anything negative about China. Moral warfare is, a, is a, um, very effective, but it has the potential of becoming you know, very puritanical and very restrictive and very in, in a cost stagnation because it doesn't allow any deviance. Uh, we'll get into China later. I got a couple of detailed questions about China, but back to the resistance. Sure. The structure of the resistance, because it isn't directly coupled with mainstream media, there has to be some uh, human energy that keeps it going. You know, the Donald had 600,000 people or whatever it is. Uh, where's, where are the bodies and is there any convergent zones in the resistance where ideas come together and get upregulated, et cetera? Oh, what's yeah. the, what's it, the, net, the network topology? What's it look like? It's Twitter. Twitter is the, the, the focal point for the, the resistance. And it's millions of people. And those, that Twitter conversation is constantly, when they find, you know, at, at the personal level, when they find, you know, violations of what they consider uh, in their value system, their moral code, uh, they'll, they'll point that out and it goes onto Twitter first. And uh, everyone responds to that, expresses their outrage. And that's where they reach in also to different organizations. If they find a bureaucrat that's not doing, you know, following what they consider the correct behavior, they'll reach in and touch that person directly, call them out. Yeah, Twitter is the, is the, uh, the main vehicle for the resistance. Okay, that seems to make sense. Uh, it be interesting to see how these networks morph as we go into 2020 and the stakes move up, right? Will the insurgency invade Twitter? I mean, there's plenty of insurgency people on Twitter. I see both sides all the time on Twitter. It doesn't work as well. Yeah, the insurgency doesn't work as well on Twitter as as the resistance. It's 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 more of a broadcast medium. So you know they're they're moving. What they do is you know through their conversation is they move towards a consensus on a specific topic or a specific you know value, and when they reach that consensus, then they enforce it. It's consensus seeking, which is different from the insurgency. I mean that if you had the I just was in the process of writing this this month's report, and it's about the, or one of the reports I'm writing this month. It's it's this new political spectrum. Is that you have on the one side this consensus seeking, consensus driven value system, which is the resistance, and then on the other side you have uh, this disruptive capability, and they're in tension, and you know the network that's driving the, this, this new value system has the ability to reach into all the old bureaucracies and, and down to the individual level and, and set them in a, in a, in a very uh, specific direction. And the disruptive capability comes in and if, those, if that uh, uh, value system is too restrictive or pointing in the wrong direction, the, uh, the insurgency would disrupt it and cause it to uh, reset itself or go back to a, a an earlier stage. You follow me on that? Absolutely. In fact, it's a perfect transition to my next point. You've written quite a bit about coherence, right? And especially about the ever-growing decoherence in the West. You know, frankly, I'm coming more and more to believe that an unconscious libido for social coherence is the invisible force field that's driving a lot of our social turmoil. And, you know, what you just said resonates with that a lot, right? The resistance yep. is people who unconsciously are starved for coherence. You know, the market has replaced the community. The government has replaced the family. We live in flat land uh, where no one really needs to have any adherence to anything to live in modern democratic liberalism. Groups like the resistance offer a coherence, right? Right. It's an, a new brand of coherence. And a coherence is very powerful. If we look at you know work from people like Peter Turchin, who has studied uh, the rise and fall of empires, you know, the, the emergence of small borderlands groups that bring down empires, et cetera. He always points to a word he uses, asabia, but very similar to coherence. Uh, that would seem to indicate that in a fight, resistance might have an advantage over insurgency if resistance is based on coherence and insurgency isn't unless you uh, have coherence around the around the wrong idea or that you 
value stability over everything else. So if you had to draw the political spectrum at a global scale, you would have China on one side and Russia on the other. China is obviously you know, more successful, um, but it's, it's just started the lockdown process. And if they achieve total coherence and totally enforced by their social credit system and, and, and the like, you can see the stagnation threat there. Uh, where no new ideas are, are allowed because they can violate or disrupt the, the stasis. On the other hand, you know, too much disruption, you end up, you know, corrupt like Russia or, or Trump. Yeah, you see exactly the same battle here in the U.S. You have the kind of the, this Chinese value lockdown on the one side, uh, and then you see this kind of corrupt uh, disruption on the other side. I think that's actually a benefit. I think that's actually the best place to be is at that edge, that dynamic edge between the two. And that will allow us to maintain the, the maximum creativity without falling completely apart going forward. Whereas the other sides are, are you know, they're, they're going to, they're, they're screwed. Yeah, the Russians have lost all their innovative capacity through pure corruption, right? There's, right. there's no way for anyone to create anything without having it stolen, essentially. And as you point out, we'll, we'll go on to the Chinese here next. But, you know, the Chinese face the potential risk of becoming stultifyingly coherent, right? And right. In fact, I have a term I like to use. Maybe this is similar to your edge between the two. I call it coherent pluralism. There seems to be, to my mind, two error points. One is too much coherence. Think of the Middle Ages, right, at some level, or fascism or Marxist-Leninism. Uh, and then the other extreme is no coherence, you know, essentially chaotic uh, space, Somalia at its, in its worst days, et cetera. And Trump seems to be a pretty uh, incoherent character in his own right. And maybe the right place is to right-size the coherent kernel, and, but then make it a clear part of our, called the Jeffersonian Madisonian operating system, as they did with religion, that we have pluralism outside the core. And yet that seems to be something that humans have a hard time doing. You know, they want to totalize one way or the other. They want right. to either be, you know, radical libertarians or, uh, you know, high-end utopians and trying to find that balance of the right amount of coherence to make a society feel good for people. I mean, I would argue our current Western society has too little coherence. Uh, we don't have enough duty to our society. Uh, you know, there's no real sense of belonging to a society. It's all transactional and commercial. Yep. But on the other hand, uh, stultifying Chinese uh, neo-fascism isn't the answer either. So maybe something in between is, is, a, is a way to think about it. Coherence, but bounded. Yeah. I mean, the grand historical narrative behind this, at least from my perspective, is that the internet is the equivalent of the printing press in terms of its effect on society. And I look at it through the kind of McLuhan, Marshall McLuhan lens. It's uh, that this technology is rewiring us. It's changing the way we think at a very root level. Um, and that it's that change is going to change the way we uh, organize our society. And um, I mean, with the printing press, you saw the emergence of bureaucracies as a replacement to the kind of the feudal noble system. Um, you saw the shattering of the universal church. Religion has been in a downward slope since then. Um, in terms of its influence, you saw the rise of democracy, at least the institutionalized democracy. You know, and you saw the rise of science made possible by the printing press. It, you know, the kind of these bureaucracies have, have changed everything, and they wouldn't have been possible without the without that kind of technological change. So we have the, you know, the internet hitting us and social networking really has been the, the big mover within that. Um, and that, um, you know, we're being rewired. Uh, the old bureaucratic system is becoming less effective. Um, and the, the old kind of tribal element, uh, nationalism has become less effective in terms of keeping us connected. You know, there's three different uh, uh, decision-making systems that we've kind of cobbled together to kind of produce the um, system we live in now. As I got this uh, uh, David Ronfeldt's, you know, Timmin framework. It's a tribes, uh, institutions, markets, and networks. And institutions being the bureaucracies and the bureaucratic kind of organizational cockroach that, that transformed uh, us from uh, the ancient world into the modern world. And tribes, which provided us kind of a connection, allowed us to trust each other 
enough that we can make decisions as a group. You know, if you're a part of the same tribe, you, you, you ascribe to the same narrative, tribal narrative, uh, you know, why you are uh, special and why you should remain together. You can trust the information that comes from that person. When you shatter a tribe, like we're seeing now, uh, you can't trust the information that's provided by the people who aren't in your tribe. I mean, you fundamentally distrust it. Um, so when people look at what's coming out of the media or out, out of you know anyone on Trump's side, I mean, it's fundamentally distrusted, regardless of whether it's correct or not. So those you know tribal tribal system and the bureaucracy is is fading. The institutional part is fading. Uh, markets are being you know relatively easy to corrupt uh, and concentrate. They become over concentrated and and you know replicated many of the bad features of central planning, and. So here comes networking in this kind of you know broad, this new kind of uh, decision making system, and how does that work? You know, and we're just finding out that it has two functions: it can be a disruptive function, throw things into chaos, and and then it can also can set a consensus or come to you know, consensus on values, on new sets of values, values that work, um, and that they can reach down into organizations, into bureaucracies. And the big battle being in the future, they will be able to reach down into uh, corporate land and uh, force corporate compliance to these value systems. And presumably, there'll be competing ones. I mean, you know, we have now the resistance has taken that form, but it would seem natural that there will have to be a other side to that. So there'll be at least two and probably more than that competing coherent quasi-tribal systems. So far, there only looks like there are going to be two, China and the rest of the world. Well, I was thinking even within our society, right? Even just oh no, I I don't think they can last. I mean, the these networks tend to be um, they tend to expand and crush any opposition within their space. It's it's a I don't I don't I don't see it. Uh, I think I think the the overall direction and and this is like another McLuhan thing is that we're headed towards this you know grand consolidation at a at a you know at a network a global network level. And that, you know, all of this fighting that we're going through and, and, and this uh, struggle that we're seeing over the long, over the next couple of decades will be about which system ends up becoming the dominant one. I wonder if that's really true. I mean, if we think, look at recent history, if we look at the nation states, they've been breaking down into smaller and smaller units. Right. Because the bureaucracy is less effective in, in a complex environment. Yeah. And also, I think people are looking for coherence also. Be my other argument. Why do the Scots want to get away from uh, uh, the UK? Why do, uh, you know, why is the Catalonians uh, so insistent on breaking away from the Spanish, which they've been, you know, married to for 500 years? But that's a lot. That's doable because there's now a, a network component that can allow them to interact. I mean, there's the EU. Granted, there's an intermediary step there. But it, being part of the same network allows you to fragment at the nation state level. They don't have to be as big. Yeah, and still be coherent, still be able to talk to each other as as friends, as, as part of the same unit. Uh, you have to have like a, a minimum standards of interconnect. Think of it as the, you know, the internet, it's like these minimum standards allowed the whole network to assemble. You have to have the same value system as a minimum standard in order to, to work together. And you can fragment the nation states down to nothing, down to micro levels, and if, if you have that same value set, it allows that to happen coherently. And, and actually, if maybe even economically efficiently, because the networks can Correct. replace many of the things the nation state was doing economically. Not everything, but many of the things. So a, a nation state of 5 million people is now quite feasible, right? Yeah. And also, the, the network allows, you, allows these small states to avoid becoming um, you know, prey to large multinational corporations, too. I mean, it's, you know, these networks have the ability to change the policy or change the alignment of large multinationals. So if you were running the Extinction Rebellion, you wouldn't be protesting government. You'd be picking out a company as a victim and forcing them into alignment. And one month after a month, you know, again and again and again until they, until you have sufficient number of companies aligned with you. Yeah, there's another good example of an emergent, coherent group from uh, the Nets is the Extinction Rebellion. I've been saying for some time that one could go a long, long, long way. That could be the, uh, you know, the, the unexpected invention of Christianity equivalent, right? That 12 random dudes in Galilee changed the world. In this case, it could be uh, whoever started the Extinction Rebellion could end up changing the world. Yeah, it, it, 
they'll probably end up folding into the larger, you know, resistance network, whatever that you can call it, uh, whatever at that point, because it's not really resistance so much as it is a kind of a value consensus is that, you know, the other thing that this, that everyone's battling over is this idea of, of being able to set the conditions of the AIs, the social AIs that are being developed. And um, I mean, the winner sets those conditions. And what I mean by that is a is that what we're finding with AI, at least from my perspective, is that it really isn't really great at producing a human equivalent intelligence. I mean, we don't even properly utilize the you know, 7 billion people we have right now with the human level intelligence. Um, creating more of that is just kind of a useless activity where it really seems to be shining and, and, and based on the amount of data that's available and the data is highly correlated with the quality of the, of the, the AI is um, you know, more is better, um, is that in this, social space. Uh, it's great at managing. It learns a lot about managing the connections between us. And as we know, in complex systems, the connections matter more than the individual units. So managing that that connection space is what AI is really going to shine at doing. And we have the potential then to create social systems that are technological artifacts and that we'll have one from China and we'll have one from the rest of the world. And setting those, the goals that this AI is going to try to accomplish or try to, um, you know, instantiate in, in this society is going to be the biggest fight ever. I mean, you know, who's, who's going to actually control it? I mean, it's an incredible power. And if you get it wrong, you wither as a society, you, you destroy whatever you built. And of course, there's quite a growing suspicion from both Team Red and Team Blue about the unprecedented power that Google and Facebook in particular have to manipulate the lens with which we see the world. It's a very interesting, difficult problem. And frankly, they may be good guys, but I'm a Madisonian. I don't trust any single source of power. So if I were to suggest, you know, the, the road forward to make sure that we don't end up with a corrupt set of lenses from the Googles and the Facebooks is we need competitors. And fortunately, uh, there are people working on competitors, uh, you know, under, under uh, overcoming the network effects of Google and Facebook is not easy. So they won't be general solutions initially, maybe a network for, you know, the 100,000 people who are most, uh, see most clearly, let's shall we say, uh, or the uh, million people most interested in the uh, Extinction Rebellion who will set up a powerful and coherent social network, which will then aggregate people over time. And in that way, we can, it's probably the safest way to hedge the bet from uh, the Facebooks and Googles implementing a set of filters and AIs that implement their vision of the good and the true. Oh, yeah. There's the bottom up, top down, you know, conflict. You know, the insurgency tends to focus on trying to you know, uh, prevent these systems from having any influence. They don't want any controls. They don't want any, any influence, undue influence coming from the, the big social AIs. I mean, those are the biggest AIs we interact with by long shot. I mean, two and a half billion people on Facebook interact with a you know, social AI right now, every day. And then, it, you know, there's all this pressure right now, obviously, from the resistance to kind of come up with the consensus values that are written into this AI. I mean, there's lots of, lots of conflict points. I, the, only, the only thing that would be tough for a bottoms up version of this is the data. The way these systems learn is that they require tons of data. They don't work off of, you know, the kind of first principles that, uh, you know, we've derived over time through science. And, um, you know, if you can't get that data, you can't get good. So there's got to be a, whoever, whoever comes up with something new has to find a way to get more data. Well, at least they have to have enough data. The question is, what is sufficient for the task? And, you know, I'll throw out a hypothesis. Maybe, you know, an intense coherence is enough to get a founder community that's big enough, which might be 100,000 to a million, that the network can start to tune itself from. So you use coherence to jumpstart and build an environment that's perceived to be of higher quality than the kind of flat land of, of Facebook. And then once you have a critical mass built on coherence, uh, then you have the numbers to you know, start to use the technology to, you know, and if your uh, ideas are good enough and your coherence is pleasing enough to people, uh, you will find, you will get defectors. I mean, this is, you know, you, I think you followed this discussion called game A and game B. Yep. And, and essentially that that's, 
the argument from the game beers that you don't need 300 million people in the United States to be game B on day one. You need some critical mass, much, much, much smaller, and you make it highly coherent and highly pleasing to be part of and have good tools. And gradually you get defectors from game A and game B gets stronger and stronger. And it, it's less dependent on the quality of the AIs in the short term because it has something else, coherence and a plan and good quality of life. So I think there are, you know, you don't have to attack strength to strength. As we know, in asymmetric warfare, you don't attack strength to strength. You attack somewhere else. You know, game B will attack uh, through coherence and quality of existence rather than by brute numbers and kind of brute force AI. At least that's the game B hypothesis. Yeah, um, I would look in terms of evaluating those, those alternatives, I would focus on the quality of the interactions. If that system, if that game B system is providing um, higher quality interactions than the alternative, more so than the, it, the end states for the individual participants. If that, you know, it's like, for instance, um, did you ever read uh, Maniki Neko from Bruce Sterling? No. Okay. Great short science fiction story. Bruce is probably one of the best science fiction writers I've ever come across. You know, Schizmatrix is amazing and, and Maniki Neko is, is a great, it's online. You could probably find it for free. And it has a system that is a gifting system that kind of takes off in this direction. It comes out of nowhere. You know, like early tribal systems were always, you know, gifting and that barter was only uh, where you cleared the transaction at the end of the, you know, end of the engagement was only done between enemies, right? And then we scaled the enemy component all the way up to a, to a global system because it, we couldn't maintain the trust necessary on the tribal side to and find a way to, to scale it. Um, is that in that in the Maniki Neko universe, it, they had a system that kept track of basically your karma and, and, and kept track of the needs and wants, the immediate needs and wants, as well as the long-term needs and wants of the individuals that are part of the network. And that they were constantly gifting, you know, connecting people and, and saying, if you gift this, to this person right now, you will gain, you know, access to more gifts future in the future and your prioritization will go up. So if somebody just lost a job or had a bad day and they in the system knew that they loved coffee and they're sitting at a park bench and kind of thinking, oh my God, the world is terrible. They would interact with somebody in the network and say, bring a coffee to this person. This is the type of coffee that they like. And you do it and they go, wow, that's awesome. Or if they needed a job of a specific type, or an engagement or, or a specific item that's preventing them from doing or achieving some goal that, that the system would interconnect and, and allow that interconnection to, to accelerate their, their path forward. Eventually, you know, if this system gets good enough, at least in the short story, that it would replace standard economic engagement because you got everything that you really truly needed through the gifting process. And that's not far from, you know, the thinking of people like Daniel Schmachtenberger from the Game B space, right, who is looking for a alternative non-rivalrous form of organization for the means of life that aren't all, you know, brutal market driven. And I don't think we yet know what that looks like, but those are the kind of places that people are probing on. And, you know, again, when they come, they'll come from nowhere. They'll come from a small group of people who've cooked up a new social operating system that actually outcompetes the existing one in terms of qualitative experience. Because I think you're absolutely right that the, it's like the hippies, right? It was fun to be a hippie. It was much more fun to be a hippie than a straight in 1967, right? I was a junior yeah. high school kid, so I didn't get to play that game, but you saw it, right? And so if Game B or some other new startup social operating system has a better form of existence for people in the same way Christianity did. I mean, it was not as brutal and harsh as Roman life was, right? Uh, and it was much more coherence and taking care of each other. It could you know, gain momentum and go all the way. And it would seem that at this moment, our systems are old and tired and fragile. The life that they're providing for people, while materially better than it's ever been by a whole lot, from the perspective of meeting our real human needs, I would say not so good, right? Look at the, you know, the rates of deaths of despair amongst uh, middle-aged uh, working people. You know, our system is not working for most people and there's room for an upstart to come and take it over. Right. Yeah. I mean, you know, um, when the printing press hit, it wasn't really quite, we weren't quite sure what would 
come out of that in terms of, you know, new organizational types, new decision-making systems. Um, and, um, I mean, who could have envisioned the, the rise of bureaucracy, um, you know, the modern form of bureaucracy with all the bells and whistles that we see with, you know, individuals who are civil servants, who have a certain ethical code, who are very content, you know, to do their job without, you know, immediate recompense. All of that uh, would have come out of that technological change and how it would transform governance and then transform our lives. And so we're in this same place with networks, you know, you know, how is that going to be used to, you know, transform our life? And, and right now we're seeing it on the, you know, the open source side and we see two functions, but there are plenty more out there. We just have to discover them. Yep. And there's like, we can rethink our democracy. For instance, ideas like liquid democracy really could not be done until you had computer networks. And that may be a better way to govern ourselves. Not sure. Some interesting aspects of it, but it hasn't been tried at scale. So, but if it, if it turns out to be better, societies that adopt it will outcompete those that don't. Well, if the way the networks are operating right now, and you look at, you know, they've taken over the political spectrum, um, the new left is not going to, you know, follow the pattern of the old left where it's, you know, looking at, uh, uh, you know, raising taxes or raising money. That's that path is blocked. Trying to raise money from, you know, globalized wealth is very, very tough. Um, the regulation is tough too because the companies and the and and the wealth would, you know, skip away. Um, so, you know, the kind of Warren approach becomes difficult to implement um, because there's so many workarounds and so many ways to, you know, to beat what she's proposing. The thing that's tough to beat, and I think impossible for the traditional corporate bureaucracies and and, and organizations to, to beat, is a, a left that uses like kind of the presidency and its position in Congress as kind of a bully pulpit, or to also as a um, you know coercive system to force corporations and 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 govern bureaucracies into alignment, force a very specific consensus value system into into place. And forcing companies to provide service and move in a certain direction. Uh, if you price your pharmacological goods too high, you get crushed. And if you try to, you know, take advantage of, of a certain uh, market opportunity at the expense of, you know, Americans, or um, then you get crushed. And it's not just at the top level; it, you know, at the corporate level, uh, this network can actually reach deep inside the company and go after individuals. Maybe the redress we've been looking for, right? Uh, you know, the problem since the 70s has been increasing returns to scale. Network businesses have allowed businesses to get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. They've corrupted the political process and there was no constraint on them. Correct. Perhaps uh, this form of political organizing is the redress that that kind of predatory behavior is calling for. Yeah, I mean, all of our focus right now is on the disorder, the Trump disorder, and and, and associated with you know Bolsonaro and all those others. Um, but the real danger of the system is too much coherence. It's too easy to achieve, you know, maximal coherence. Um, you have to have a little bit of disorder and disruption in order to make sure that it doesn't opt too heavily in that direction, or else you get stasis and you get you get repression, you get oppression, and it's just built into the system and it can't get rid of it. And your economy suffers and everything suffers as a result. So, and granted, you don't want too much disruption. You end up, you know, this kind of hyper corruption like you have in Russia, where Putin is like the wealthiest guy in the world with, I, you know, I've seen estimates of 200 billion. So it makes him twice as wealthy as, as Bezos. He uses the network to disrupt opponents and keep the political process fluid and allows him to do basically anything he wants at, at, at the corruption level and to consolidate power. He'd love to be able to do that if he could get away with it, right? <laughs> oh, yeah, if he could. But I mean, the thing is, I think the tendency here, the, the system that's, you know, dominant, if there was a, you know, is towards a, a, a hyper coherent system. And, you know, I don't think we want to go that direction completely. We want to keep it fluid enough that we can change it and modify it uh, as it moves forward. Also, we're, we're in for a world of heart. Oh, yeah, but I would say that, you know, you draw this picture of a left coherence doing its thing. If we learn anything from, you know, our constitutional history, it's always an arms race. There will be a equivalent on the right very quickly, right? So there'll be multiple moralities that are attempting to subdue corporate America and the bureaucracy. And hopefully there'll be more than two. And, you know, we're, we're locked into two in our political process by a design flaw in our institutions, which is the first past the post election method. And 
our influence networks and uh, you know, let's say uh, moral networks are not necessarily going to be constrained by that. So instead of two, we might have 10 of groups that are attempting to shame corporations and bureaucracies from doing bad things. And those 10 groups won't agree on what's the good things and what's the bad things. So that will, will have a pluralistic way to work that out. I don't see the woke left winning. I mean, those people are they just piss off way too many people. And if they ever go too far, <laughs> they're going to be in for a big fucking awakening, right? <laughs> yeah. Well, the right ends up becoming pretty much just pure disruption. Or not. Well, I don't see them competing. I mean, it's, I see this, this natural tension between this like consensus values versus that you know, is scalable internationally and this disruptive capability, which is basically saying, you know, we, we want a many different viewpoints and we want... Uh, different moralities to exist, uh, different you know value systems to exist, uh, just leave us alone. Yeah, well, of course, that may well be the ethos, right? If you have a, right. um, and of course, that's been a very simplistic way. That's been the difference between the left and the right in politics, uh, you know, since the founding, the leave us alone faction, and we know better than you, let us fix it faction, right? Well, that's the, that's the Tom Wolf quote, remember? He goes, uh, America is always in danger of fascism, but Europe always becomes fascist. Is that uh, it, the American right has always been a kind of a leave me alone yep. version, um, and that the European, because of the kind of you know cultural coherence that they have, tends to choose fascism as a as a as its right wing solution. Um, it's not possible here in the way. It's difficult, at least. Uh, the right, you know, for instance, might well, and as it's starting to do, fight against the social platforms trying to enforce some political orthodoxy on discourse. Right, right. And that would be a moral argument that in the same way we always wanted independent newspapers, uh, we want censorship free from content bias, right? Maybe you have censorship based on behavior. For instance, thou shalt not threaten violence against identifiable people. Thou shalt not dox, et cetera, but apply those uniformly across the political spectrum, not just to one side or the other, as uh, it seems to be the tendency these days. Well, that's the job of the insurgency, right? Is to, to unearth those as it evolves, as it matures, is to unearth those moral arguments that are antithetical to the consensus values that are being put forward, and then using those to disrupt those that consolidation process. Um, that's a more you know beneficial way of looking at it. And that you know if those mar arguments are valid, and then they're going to be effective in terms of disrupting that that consolidation. Yeah, it's an interesting political time. I I think we're in exactly the right place. I mean, you know, Russia and China are are, are doomed, and then Europe. Uh, the way they uh, uh, disconnected themselves from this and trying to hide and bubble themselves up, they are totally screwed. As far as I'm concerned, they're basically saying, you know, we don't want industrialization at the beginning of the industrial age. They're deindustrialized. They're becoming fragile. They're in, in self-imposed fragility. They're not building the, the muscle tissue necessary to operate at this edge. And that, um, you know, intellectual muscle or social muscle tissue, they're too worried about the downside effects. And that um, it, on top of that, they're not uh, contributing the data that's going to go into development of all the AIs that, that will be incorporated as services or into the products that, that we're going to be buying in 20 years. So I don't know how that's going to affect their economy, but it can't be good. Yeah, it's amazing how, how little they've accomplished in the world in the last 20 or 30 years. It's going to get worse. I read an article, I think, I think in The Economist recently, said that you know uh, 30 years ago, 25% of the 40 largest corporations on earth were European. Now it's two, and they're in positions 36 and 38. And what new thing have they created? I can't think of any. What, what new has come out of uh, Europe that had any lasting uh, staying power over the last 25 or 30 years? Nothing, right? They just have culture... Yeah. They have culture that they sell. Yeah. No, I, I mean, basically, they're a tourist location. Yep. And in fact, a science fiction writer, I forget which one, had a near future. And essentially, he described Europe as had decided it was going to become the museum of Western civilization. And that was all. Anyway, let's switch to the topic we've hit on two or three times tangentially. I'd like, really like you to dig in on this because I know you've thought about this a lot. Uh, and this is one where I know I think we have a certain amount of alignment in that You've called out the Chinese model as what it really is, which is neo-fascism, right? Right. It, it's no form of leftism. It's got every aspect of neo-fascism. And uh, I've done the same in a paper I wrote called In Search of the Fifth Attractor. It's available on Medium, where I describe the neo-fascist model's exemplar as China. You know, data-driven, technologically enabled, social credit, 
facial recognition and more. Tell us about what you think the Chinese are trying to do and to what degree do you think it'll work? Okay. Well, um, you know, I, I went back to try to get to first principles. I mean, what are, what is the fascist model at a organizational level? As a, you know, how does it really work? And, you know, I went back to the 20th century and I looked at the three different models that emerged out of there, the, the communist model, the fascist model, and, and the democratic capitalism. And it really had to do with how the bureaucracies were organized. And in ch- communism, obviously, there was one big bureaucracy. It ran everything, the economy, society, et cetera. And that in democratic capitalism, there was a you know, truncated or a constrained government bureaucracy. And then there was lots of corporate bureaucracies that were given free reign within a, you know, a large playing field. They stayed relatively loyal because of the dynamics of the way that the world worked, you know, Cold War, time and distance constraints. And then you had um, fascism, which we've pretty much forgotten. We kind of just looked at jackboots and uniforms, you know, as a, a science of fascism. But the organizational, the economic organizational model is, is pretty interesting. And if you really dig into it, you go, okay, they had a, a government bureaucracy and lots of big corporate bureaucracies that joined with it as a cohesive whole. The government provided a national goal, which aligned all those big bureaucracies to f- focus on the similar goal. And they focused less on competition and more on negotiation. I mean, even if you looked at the unions that they consolidated all the unions into one big union, and that union had incredible pay for all the the members and you know industrial workers. They even had three cruise ships that gave out for free for to you know to all the members. I mean, it wasn't just like exploitative. It was if you want all these benefits, you have to negotiate with the big companies and align on the same goals. Now, in order to get that alignment, at least at that time, the focus was on you know crude tribalisms and you know the tribal appeals to identity, all the worst kind of stuff, hyper-militarism, hyper-nationalism, um, as a means of setting those goals for all the corporate participants. And when that was, you know, system was crushed, we pretty much forgot about it. But now we have a new system. Uh, we, we, you know, democratic capitalism won, beat the communist system in the Cold War. Uh, we thought it was going to go everywhere. But what we ended up doing is globalizing and we allowed the internet to connect up everyone and there's, you know, the system became complex uh, and divergent and the effectiveness of the uh, government bureaucracy in, in democratic capitalism became less, it became less and less effective, less able to raise money, less able to control its borders, less able to uh, influence policy over the long, every, you know, implement a policy and find it goes wrong within months. Uh, and because the, the system is, is moving too quickly. And the corporate participants, you know, broke out of their box and they were able to go international and they were starting to think international and they think, oh, we're not really loyal to the US anymore. You know, we're loyal to, you know, global audience and, and we have different ideals and different ways of looking at the world. So in response to this chaos, what we're seeing is the development of workarounds. And in China was looking at, you know, transforming their system. Uh, they were, you know, still relatively totalitarian and and they opted for a system that looks very organized in almost exactly the same way as the fascist model. Uh, you can see it at work now in the, in the conflict with Hong Kong is that they were looking for corporations to sign on um, in compliance with you know, enforcing their stance against the protesters. So if they have a protesters working for them and they recognize that, that person as such, they're supposed to fire them and turn off support for people who support the protest, et cetera. Um, or they're aligning with their, they're aligning their companies to focus on creating a social credit network that works on kind of a Confucian model that is very patriotic, that doesn't allow uh, anyone to discuss specific topics or criticize the government. So, you know, their system is this new type of fascism. So, you know, you can, you, you see, you can actually see the battle going, you know, working on the, on the street level, the battle over, you know, corporate alignment uh, in Hong Kong uh, is that, you know, the government has companies that they've forced into alignment, you know, you're kind of using the fascist system and uh, the protesters as an open source network are trying to uh, punish those companies. So they'll selectively uh, deface the, the buildings or the, uh, the storefronts of companies that have opted to support China. So you'll see it just, you know, dot, 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 dot down the street as the protest moves forward with the companies that are uh, fighting them being punished for that activity. So you know it's it's pretty interesting to see the uh, the emergence of fascism. Um, you can see the battle in the states is is in some ways very similar to that. You know who gets to control the companies, 
uh, can you force them into alignment to reduce the instability caused by globalization, et cetera. You see that in Russia, Russia has already done it through cross holdings and mafia style tactics. Anyway, fascism is back. Uh, it's probably the true winner of the big conflict between the three different systems, but it's different and it's not, doesn't look and feel exactly like the, the previous version of it. History doesn't repeat, but it rhymes, right? Yeah. That would point back to, you know, those as, uh, again, the driver is the libido for coherence. You know, the uh, resistance is trying to produce some coherence at the intersection of humanity and corporate America. Right. Uh, and again, with the danger of overshooting and become stifling and uh, just full of, you know, wrong ideas in their particular case. There's some good, some good ideas, some bad ideas. The Chinese are also probably at least partially operating in good faith, trying to produce a better society by making sure their corporations don't go hyper capitalist like the West did. Right. And so again, they're attempting to create more coherence. That, I mean, that's, I'm starting to see this as the seer stone. If you start thinking about in terms of greater versus lesser coherence, I think you start to see what the drivers of all these various systems are, including the Chinese at least until it enters its corrupt phase, uh, which of course it always has been more corrupt than the US, though not as corrupt as China, could either go to develop good institutions to administer sort of a positive fascism, or probably more likely it'll be captured and become hyper corrupt like Russia, just become an extraction mechanism for those who have the levers of power. Right. Yep. Uh, and, and coherence is a uh, you know, foundational state you need in order to make decisions, effective decisions. So, um, you know, without it, nothing is possible. Yeah. What do you think about the chance of the Chinese model spreading elsewhere? I mean, to the degree the Chinese want to do their thing in China, I don't really give a shit, tell you the truth. To the degree they want to put their network model out into the world and compete the way the Marxist-Leninists did, uh, then that's a completely different kettle of fish. Yeah, it, it, conceptually it works. You know, you get the a social credit system that works. You get their re-education system. They're putting the Uyghurs through. Uh, potentially it would work as, you know, wiping out Islam as a religion and replacing it with Chinese culture. But the problem is it's too tied to the culture. I don't know how exportable that is. Um, I mean, granted, there are countries that will embrace it. You know, it could have Singapore embrace it, for instance, you know, extension, kind of, kind of culture as a service, or stability or coherence as a service. We'll take care of your, uh, you know, their re-education camps as a service. Like I will take care of your, your, uh, recalcitrant minorities and realign them. And then we'll provide a system for uh, connecting up your, your citizens. But see, the thing is, I think it's too tied to the, the Confucian system. You got to get it, get it and the Chinese culture in, in general. Yeah, I agree with you. That's why I'm less concerned about it perhaps than some. So if the Chinese want to build their country that way, let them have at it, right? Right. It does not seem likely to be the kind of thing that would spread. Though, as you do, as you point out, though, uh, the technology, the underlying technology is likely to spread. Uh, you know, every semi-dictator, wannabe dictator is going to want to uh, have get their hands on some of that technology. The uh, you know the facial recognition scanning systems, the social credit systems, perhaps. So that may not work in you know, many cultures. I don't think that would work in the United States, at least not currently. It may work in, uh, in or certainly wouldn't work in a place like India, where there's you know such a vast amount of incoherence. But some of those technologies, uh, re-education camps, might be one that's exportable. It's the technologies that are likely to be exportable rather than the the system itself. Yeah, point technologies. It's yeah, it's going to be tougher. It, it, they won't be able to you know create in a box solution for this. It's just not going to not going to be possible. You know, and and it also the the fact that they're so uh, inward looking is, and all the data they're gathering is you know from a single region, is that the all the products are going to, going to produce for global audiences everything that's going to be infused with AIs, built on data um, that's been captured uh, will will seem kind of clunky. You know, it's built and optimized for a Chinese audience. I mean. You know, highly optimized. If you're gathering data from all over the world, like Facebook is right now, and you know, two and a half billion people, uh, any product that's developed out of that is likely going to be superior in meeting the needs of those those constituent populations. I mean, they're contributing little bits of data that the that's being incorporated into development of that system. Little nuances, little things that make it better, make it more effective. China's not getting that. China doesn't have it. 
Yeah, I think you're right. I mean, so I think you know, probably both of us are less concerned about China maybe than some people are. You know, China may do its thing and it may be weird and we may not like it, but as long as it's not spreading around the world, why should we care? Yeah, correct. I mean, it, it, they are spreading to a certain extent. They're exerting influence. You saw the, you know, the South Park thing and you saw the, the NBA folding like, you know, a deck of cards. It's like, yeah, it's just that kind of influence spread is, is, is not something we, we should put up with. Yeah, that's economic. And that's, again, where our goddamn corporations worship the almighty dollar over any higher values, right? Well, they're forcing them into alignment. It's the fascist model. So, you know, we need, we need a, you know, the resistance network, if it was able to actually set the value system for those corporations, they would be potentially resistant to that. And the companies would say, you know, take a hike. Exactly. That's the alternative. And, you know, we do have examples, uh, give them credit. Both Google and Facebook have not been willing to play the game with the Chinese, at least so far. Clearly, Google would kind of like to figure out how to do it, but they haven't. You know, the, the real offender, to my mind, you know, is, uh, is Cisco. People don't realize this, but Cisco is the ones that helped the Chinese design their great firewall. Right. Uh, they, they have essentially were the enabling catalyst for all China has done in terms of managing their information flows. And so they've been a very bad citizen. And I would like to see something like the resistance put a thumb on corporations and say, you know, you really shouldn't be empowering totalitarian dictators. Yep. And, you know, this, this NBA example is a fine example. Unfortunately, hypercapitalism, you know, you know, the NBA sees China as their next big market. And so they don't give two shits about Chinese culture or coherence, but they just see the possibility of losing out to, uh, uh, you know, a large dollar denominated market. So, you know, our weakness, hypercapitalism gets exploited by the more coherent system over in China. Uh, if we had a, a more coherent system, uh, our uh, companies would be less manipulatable. Correct. And they would be more downsides to actually folding like that. Yeah, exactly. Um, so you would actually lose more by trying to you know, focus on the, on the come of a new market that may, may or may not pan out. All right. Got a couple of little small things here before we sign off. You've written recently about how our very much bulked up counterterrorism efforts are now being turned on domestic right wing groups. Uh, what's happening? What are the implications? Well, there's been a kind of a drumbeat in the background. You know, whenever there's a, been a you know an attack by a you know, white nationalist to, to uh, start to turn and create the, the legal structures necessary to have counterterrorism focus inward. And my background is counterterrorism. I did five years in a tier one spec ops unit. You know, one of the few people who were in those units back then. And um, you know, it's it's a pretty terrifying instrument. It's you know, we put incredible amounts of money into it. Um, fo so far, it's been focused almost exclusively ex externally. You know, the stuff that we do domestically is, you know, a you know, little bit, you know, hyped up law enforcement. The stuff we do externally is as aggressive as all get out. And uh, the the idea that there's a, a white nationalist threat internally that requires, you know, turning a the, the counter terrorist system um, on domestic targets. Uh, with its powers of mass surveillance and uh, you know enemies lists and stripping national you know national identity and and uh, extradition and all sorts of stuff along that line is is pretty scary and I don't want to see it. it. It's the kind of thing that would run out of control. So if you know if you first have it focused on these guys who aren't really affiliated with any specific group, they're, they're you know self activating and. Um, it would, you know, bleed into, you know, going after the Antifa, going after environmentalists. There's an unlimited number of targets that it can start to focus on um, very aggressively. I mean, on a level of aggression that we haven't seen here in the States. Yeah, there's always been a low level of that with respect to the radical environmentalists. There's always been a working group in uh, the FBI working on on ELF and some of the other radical environmentalist groups. But, it, but again, it's been on the small I think what you're, I'm hearing you say is uh, if you were to bring any any measurable fraction of the $80 billion a year we spend on counterterrorism internationally, uh, it could be extraordinarily ugly in the United States. Yeah, and the people and the tactics and the, and the, and the, uh, the legal structures that it would allow them to operate at the level that they're inter operating internationally. Yeah. I mean, if you know, you know about the way they surveil outside the U.S. versus inside, I mean, there's lots and lots of restrictions. Um, so many restrictions on what they can do inside. But if those 
like a say an anti-Trump wave comes through and there's a couple of attacks and and there's a consensus in the in the U.S. government to pass this legislation to kind of root it out. You could see things that we do internationally with as a matter of course being done internally. Um, you know, use of drones, use of use of uh, renditions. Uh, use of uh, uh, excessive force and excessive monitoring. Uh, you know, if you say, okay, estimates are that 10% of the US population has, you know, some level of tacit support for white nationalism through their actions or through their words and through their deeds and trackable online, uh, should you monitor them all? Like you would a fundamentalist faction inside a, inside a target country. Should you watch all their communications and tag them and uh, anything suspicious, you, you swoop them up. You can just do the same with the Antifa and you can do the same with environmentalist. Depends on who's in power. Okay. And that's the thing that so you give, you give, yep. Sorry. Go ahead. I was just going to say, yeah, that's the thing that both sides always fucking forget. They invent these new hardball techniques and they forget that they're not going to be in power all the time. Right? Exactly. Uh, there's, will always be, uh, you know, eight years or 12 years or four years, the other side is going to then now have all these nice tools for repression that you've left. And when they, when they, they convince themselves that the, their, the excesses on their side are not really excesses, that they're, they're fine, they're, they're acceptable, um, and that you know, there's no way the opposition will ever emerge again if we're, or if we're tough enough on them, if we give enough uh, powers to a, you know, a leader, our leader, in order to eradicate them, but it never works out, and at least in democracy. Tide shifts, the opposition is in power, and and you're under the gun. Yep. I hope I hope our country isn't stupid enough to make that mistake of going down that road. And when I read that paper years ago, Jesus Christ, let's hope we're smart enough not to at least do that. I hope so. <laughs> I hope so. Well, good, you do good work trying to bring these ideas out. Last item before we go is uh, on one of your websites, uh, you said you'd, I don't know, I'm not sure when the timing on this was, you'd spent the last year working for the Joint Chiefs of the U.S. Joint, Chairman of the U.S. Joint Chief of Staff on his vision for how AGI and robotics would transform how the joint force fights in 2035. What did you learn from that exercise that you can talk to us about? Well, I mean, it was kind of strange for, um, for the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs. So they, they, they do something called concepts. Uh, usually they're on pretty mund mundane topics, how the joint force would fight today if called upon to do so. This was unusual in that they were looking 20 years out on an autonomous robotics and how that would transform the joint force, you know, for the chairman to kind of push this forward. Um, and they didn't have, you know, staff on hand that was really good at this kind of advanced autonomous weapon, future of warfare kind of thinking, um, out of the box kind of stuff. So I got brought in on that. And, uh, you know, there's, it's a, it's a funny process going through the process of creating kind of these concepts and creating, you know, new ideas in the, in, in the government. It's just, you know, most of the, most of the ideas, I mean, um, they have to go through so many hands and so many sign offs that you, everything gets watered down, but some cool stuff came out of it, at least, a, you know, in terms of where it has to go in order to be effective, you know, things like, you know, moving from, if you have an autonomous weapon, how do you verify that is effective? Well, you know, autonomous weapon, Typically in the past, we'd, we'd look at the, you know, the error rates generated by the component parts and the system as a whole, and you could measure that and uh, determine whether or not it would work. With an autonomous weapon system, the, the range of behaviors is, is much greater, and it's a black box um, if it incorporates like deep learning. And you really don't know, you can't do the reverse engineering, you can't do the you kind of peer into the system to determine whether or not it's, it's, it's uh, making decisions in the way that you would deem effective or not, or safe or not. What well, all you can do is to move towards a certification process like you would with a human being. Whereas if you have a human being and you train up to do a certain task, the only way you can actually determine whether or not they're effective at that task is to put them into that task and, and judge their behavior, certify their behavior, and do it again and again and again and again until you're satisfied that they'll do it effectively. And there's always a chance that they'll do it wrong, but you know, you have to go with that certification. And the same thing is true with a with an autonomous system. You can run through simulations and scale that up substantially, um, but you can also, you know, do that uh, uh, in the real world. And, and that's how you determine whether or not it works. So little things like that. Uh, structure, um, the potential here also is, and this is kind of interesting, is that if you learn something new 
new tactic, new capability, uh, new procedure, new maneuver, uh, that you can then capture that in its totality uh, with nuances. You know, think of it in terms of like teaching a, a, a deep learning robot how to slice a, a flying apple with a samurai sword, right? You know, you saw that online and saw that, you know, the samurai instructor changing the angle of the blade and getting it perfect. So every time they toss the apple forward, that the, the blade cut it perfectly. Well, think of that in, in the context of, of autonomous weapons. And you come up with this one new technique and then you can take that technique and then share it throughout the joint force. And how would the process of, for that work? Is that you would take it, test it, run it through thousands of simulations, so millions of simulations, billions of simulations, and a kind of a simulations, you know, uh, command that would then verify it uh, and certify it and then roll it out as a capability that can be employed in all these different systems that are compatible. Uh, that has a potentially completely change everything. Yeah, the rate of change would go so fast. You know, today it seems like military doctrines operate at like a generational time frame or half, oh, a yeah. half a generation at best, 10 years. As you point out, the beauty of AIs is once one of them knows it, they can all know it in five minutes, right? Yep. And that, you know, the uh, the whole weapon system approach where you're, you're, you're focused on the hardware improvement, it takes 20, 30 years to roll out a new weapon system, becomes less important than the intelligence of that system. And that intelligence of that system can improve very quickly over time, you know, while you're using it. Um, and that changes the, you know, kind of perspective on this. If, it, if the system's dumb and it can't get better through experience, then, you know, it's just a hunk of metal that takes too long to change. Systems that learn and get better from that interaction, um, that, that's, a, that's a system kind of a system you're shooting for. And then the difference in tactics and strategies, you know, an autonomous weapon, you know, opens up or truly autonomous weapon is, is, is like right now we can fire a weapon and, you know, like a cruise missile and, you know, six hours later it ends up on target or, or drone. You know, it's, it navigates the target. It may even make some corrections based on the opposition it, it interacts with, but it hits the target. And we're pretty comfortable with that. They're pretty destabilizing, granted, but they're, we're comfortable with how that works. Well, what about a system, autonomous system that you let go and two years later it, it launches an attack? Like it's something that actually you know, kind of drifts very slowly across the Pacific, uh, finds a Chinese harbor, digs itself into the muck of the Chinese harbor, and just waits until it and gathers information passively, figures out the best targets to hit at any given moment, and then looks for just a signal that it sh either should attack or the conditions change such that it it's ready to attack. And then you, you could start to preposition these things, and then you could like talk about truly destabilizing something that can really really change the the way war, war works is um, is that you can roll these things out and they can slowly you know preposition in a myriad of locations or you know around an a, a potential future enemy like dig themselves in to landscape and just wait and then when the conflict hits that's a true zero day right a zero day conflict it just they pop up war's over they break all the networks they destroy all the enemy capabilities they take it out keep it down you just walk in. Yeah. And also think of a ramp up possibility, you know, with, with humans, I don't know what it costs the army to train up a soldier these days, but it's certainly in the hundreds of thousands of dollars, I would imagine. And it, we know it takes a year or two before a soldier is very effective. Right. You know, a robotic soldier, you know, it might get the price down to 10,000 or $25,000 and could build them as fast as you could build factories. So uh, the thing could, you know, we could go be back to the era of World War II mass warfare with very few humans involved, but, you know, literally millions of robots fighting each other. Oh, yeah. The, 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 uh, it also makes possible, you know, war between nuclear powers where it wasn't possible before. So like, for instance, uh, Say we have a, a conflict with China over the Spratly Islands. So instead of sending in troops that, or sending in you know aircraft carriers, so they'll become big fat targets that if they do get destroyed, you know five thousand people die or ten thousand people die, which then is a pretext for nuclear war, um, too destabilizing, too too dangerous. Is that we stumble into a pattern where we demarcate an area like a hundred miles around the Spratlys and all those coral reefs and everything else, and it becomes a war between robotic systems where no human life is lost. But it's really kind of a plant the flag thing. You know, it's just a cylinder around that area and, and that all of the capabilities that you could throw into that space 
determine the victor, determine the one that can actually, it, it is it is superpower conflict, but it can constrain. Yeah, it's interesting though. It's like World War II, which eventually became an industrial outcome. You know, that's, that's interesting. Let's think about this as a game, right? Where you define this uh, 100 mile uh, diameter cylinder, maybe a little bigger than that. And the, the both sides agree, quote unquote, that we can have at it with non weapons of mass destruction, robots only. And let's see who wins, right? That could go on for a right. long time, right? Both sides cranking up more and more and more and more robots and drones and bottom crawling uh, ocean vehicles that will pop up on uh, unexpectedly at various places. Uh, it'd be pretty nuts. Uh, it would waste a huge amount of resources of humanity. Right. And then, of course, the question is, can, does it really de, uh, not escalate? You know, if the Chinese find themselves losing, are they tempted to escalate uh, nuclear weapons, say, to use EMP forces just to wipe out all the robots? Don't know. Then you have EMP resistance. Cool stuff. Yeah, it's good stuff. Was there a, was there a published report that people could get their hands on? Uh, no. There was not. This I just, don't think so. There's all just a... Most of, the stuff, most of the stuff ended up just being, you know, caught in drafts that never saw the light of day other than the senior management that ran through it. You know, this stuff will resurface. I mean, the good ideas like this never really die. They just kind of get kind of get shuttled around and there's champions that kind of stumble into it. If you really have a good idea about warfare or anything, actually, uh, it, uh, you know, I mean, I wrote my first, uh, when I was at Forrester, I wrote my first social networking report. So I called it uh, personal broadcast networks. And it was popular, but people go, how do you build this thing? You know, we can use a little bit of this and from the Netscape browser and stuff like that. But, you know, people kept on working on the idea. And it took me to 2001 to find a company actually realizing it with, the, you know, the networked approach of uh, Userland's uh, RSS blogging system. So, uh, you know, ideas can tend to come up you know, tend to surface if they're in the right, if they, if they have the kind of right system dynamics pushing them forward. Indeed. Well, John, this has been absolutely fascinating. We've covered a tremendous amount of ground as I expected we would. I think our listeners here will have learned a whole lot. So I want to thank you for coming on. Oh, my pleasure. Thanks, Jim. Production services and audio editing by Jared Jaynes Consulting. Music by Tom Muller at modernspacemusic.com.